sitting comfortably, then we'll begin. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sure you're all dying to know what's been going on in the Colonel. I'd love to know because I'd love to know what he's doing in there when I'd rather have him for other purposes. So I would, it is my distinct privilege, and by privilege I mean I bagsied it when the sign-up sheets were going around, to introduce to you the um, most brilliant and beautiful Colonel Hacker, I'm sure you'll all agree, <laughs> Ben Hutchings telling us what's new in the, in the Linux Colonel. <laughs> Here. I'm uh, hoping that my slides will appear on the. Microphone. <laughs> <laughs> mm. No, that doesn't look like my slide. I had more words on that than that. Yes, that looks like it. <laughs> okay, so uh, I gave a somewhat similar talk uh, last year uh, about what was new in the Linux kernel. And this year, some different new things have happened. So uh, the, we'll, the, this talk uh, will not be exactly the same, although it's a pretty similar shape. Uh, to just gloss over who I am, I... I'm a software developer or software engineer, depending on what my employer chooses to, to call me this year uh, by day, and Devin developer at night, although since I've started working at home, the, sometimes timing is the other way around. I've been working on the Linux kernel since about 2008, uh, both in Debian and in my paid work. I'm currently doing most of the maintenance for uploads to Unstable, aside from all the uh, non x86 ports, which I don't really know very much about. Uh, and I'm also maintaining the stable updates to Linux 3.2 at kernel.org, which then, uh, those, those then feed into Debian and various other distributions that uh, are based on 3.2. Uh, as, <coughs> as has been advised for free software projects, Linux releases early and often. Currently about five times a year. There's no uh, release schedule, but it works out as about about that. Then there are stable updates every week or two, which are just supposed to fix bugs and performance regressions. Some of the new features that appear in a stable release uh, aren't completely ready. Some of them need, uh, need support from user land. In the last year, there have been six releases, 3.11 to 3.16. So we have lots of new features, uh, some of which need integration, uh, some of which we just need to turn on in the kernel package. I'll recap what happened to the features that I talked about last year. The team device driver needed a user land support package called libteam and that ha was uploaded in October. The uh, team device is a, uh, kind of a, supposed to be a better replacement for the network bonding device. Transcendent memory um, I did think we needed to have a bit of a think about what, what to turn on, whether we needed to do some scripting, perhaps, for that. Uh, none of which has really happened, but I, when I was preparing this talk, I looked at the options that were, that were there. Um, partly, transcendent, the Transcendent Memory Framework was present, but a lot of the specific um, plugins for that were not. <laughs> so, 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 Transcendent Memory is about having a layer in between the working memory, uh, which is, uh, can be mapped into processors, and the uh, swap file uh, or swap partition and files on disk. Uh, because the disks tend to be a bit slow, it's maybe useful to have a, an intermediate layer between those. Uh, so we have now have Z-swap, uh, which lets you, instead of writing uh, instead of writing pages out to the swap partition, it said compress them, keep them in memory, um, and that sort of serves the purpose of reducing the, the amount of used memory uh, while also being, it's much, much faster to decompress uh, those not quite swapped out pages than to bring them in from the disk. Uh, Zen also supports 
um, this sort of intermediate state uh, with the aid of the hypervisor. So um, that will be enabled in the next kernel upload, Linux 3.16 point whatever it's going to be, uh, uh, going into unstable soon. The new KMS drivers that I talked about, uh, as far as I know, those are now supported by the Zorg drivers in, uh, in testing. Uh, module signing haven't been, hasn't been enabled, but that's mostly because we haven't really made progress with Secure Boot. So at the same point that, that we get kernel signing for Secure Boot, we should also have module signing, and that should give you a lot more assurance that the kernel you're running is the kernel you meant to run. Uh, it also talks about having more support for discard, which is a way of uh, improving the efficiency of SSDs. If you tell the if you tell the SSD that uh, some blocks are not currently in use, it can do a better job of uh, wear leveling, uh, and your disk should be a bit faster and last longer. Unfortunately, we're still not enabling discard uh, for SSDs automatically when you. Uh, when you install Debian, you have to know what options to turn on later. There's an open bug for that if you want to work on it. Uh, last year, I talked about improvements for two containers. Uh, we had finally had user namespaces implemented properly, so you can create a uh, you can create a container where the user IDs are uh, can start with a zero for root. Uh, and still be completely distinct from the user IDs uh, that, that are numerically the same on the outside of that container. Uh, and you can also have the, the special capabilities that are normally associate, associated with root. You can give those to the containerized root, and it will be able to, for it to uh, um, have powers over the processes in that container, but, but not outside the container. One of the blockers for that was was XFS, because every file system needs to be able to distinguish the uh, user IDs in the current user namespace from the global user IDs, which get written out to disk. Um, glad to say that has been fixed, so we've been able to enable user namespaces. And I believe LXC and uh, possibly some other container uh, systems are now using that. Uh, Bcash, I believe people are using that. I think someone reported talked about it on Planet Debian, though I don't remember who. However, the Bcash tools package that's needed to configure that uh, is not packaged. Uh, there's an open bug uh, for an open ITP bug. I think there's some kind of um, licensing mix up there that needs to be resolved. But if you're interested in Bcash, uh, please go and look at that bug, see if you can help uh, resolve it for Jesse. Uh, so ARM, multi-platform, I believe we now have a Debian installer working for some of the ARM v7 boxes with the, uh, the multi-platform kernel. Don't know if anyone can give a specific... Anyone, anyone know, anyone got DI working on v7? Well, I think it works, maybe. Um, <laughs> There's some progress on GPU drivers, I believe, um, because uh, NVIDIA, somewhat surprisingly, has helped with uh, to get Nuvo supporting their Tegra SOCs, uh, which have somewhat similar GPUs and feet to their uh, PCI Express cards. Um, so Nuvo, uh, Nuvo is suitable for both. Uh, and then the um, Novena project is sponsoring um, development of the Etna Vive driver for the GPU that's used on their uh, on their uh, laptop slash development board. Uh, quite when that will be ready, uh, I don't know. <coughs> so, getting on to the new features uh, that have ap appeared in the last year: uh, unnamed temporary files. Um, not very exciting, but kind of useful. Uh, currently, if you you can create a, fi uh, a file that is not linked into the uh, not linked into the file system using the C library temp file function, 
but actually that does have to create a file with a specific name which it will it will uh, try to generate a random random uh, random name in usually slash jump and if that fails it'll try another name and another name and another name until finally it comes up with something that no one's using and then it will immediately remove that file which didn't really need to have a name so there's now uh, a kernel feature uh, there's the option OTEMP file, and if you specify that, uh, and you specify the name of just a directory, then you'll get a direct, uh, you'll get a, a new file which is in the same file system as that directory. Sorry, assuming you have permission to write to create a file in that directory, you get a a, a, a file on the same file system uh, that doesn't have a name, never had a name. Um, and one of the interesting things you can do with that, which I, so far as I know you can't do with if you use tump file, is you, you can actually give this nameless file a name later uh, using the link at call. Uh, so the result of that is you can, uh, you can put content into your file, you can set all its metadata like permissions and uh, ACLs, whatever extra attributes you want, and link it into the file system, and it's as, as if the file had been atomically created. There's no other process is going to see this uh, file in an incomplete state. So uh, that's probably kind of useful for some applications. I'm not exactly sure what, but uh, think what you can do with that. Unfortunately, uh, it's not supported on all uh, file system types. It needs specific support in each file system. So you're going to need a fallback uh, unless you can, your application can depend on using specific file system types. And of course, it was only added in 3.11, so if you need to support the kernel versions, you still need a fallback. Um, I'm going to skip over this. Um, and come back to it if I have time at the end. The, uh, the Luster file system is apparently quite popular uh, in cluster computing applications. It's a distributed file system, which is a bit different from things like NFS. It doesn't have a central server. It's been around for a long time, since 1999. So why am I talking about this as a new feature? Uh, well. Now it's in the Linux staging directory, and it's being updated for each new uh, each new version of Linux. So at the very least, it does build against current versions of Linux. Previously, it was kind of lagging behind the kernel, and although we had Luster in Squeeze, uh, it wasn't released in Wheezy because it didn't work with Linux 3.2. Um, and unfortunately, it's dropped out of Debian <coughs> completely now. So while we have the, the kernel side of it working again, we are missing the user land side. So I uh, dropped a mail to the former Luster maintainers. Uh, maybe they'll add it back in. If you're, um, maybe they need help. So if you're interested in, in getting Luster back into Debian, that's something to look at. Uh, ButterFS. Uh, as gain support for deduplicating files, um, which you can kind of do in a way by making using hard links. But the problem with hard links is then uh, an update. You, you might not want uh, updates through one path to affect the other path. You want to share storage, but maybe have a copy on write behavior. Now, ButterFS uh, generally. Uh, doesn't update uh, data in place. Instead, it makes a new uh, it makes a new copy and it drops a reference to the to the uh, to the old data. So you can you can have data shared between files um, without necessarily linking them. Uh, snapshots are very cheap, and you can also do a kind of a cheap file copy. Currently, that requires a, a, a an IOCTL, although Possibly CP has a special option for it. I don't remember now, but you need to ask for it specifically. So uh, you may well end up with multiple copies of files anyway, and you want to save you want to save space uh, by deduplicating those. 
uh, ButterFS isn't going to do that for you automatically. Mm. It's not going to actually go out there and scan. It, it, uh, it leaves that to user land. So you still need a YouTube tool. And you need one that's going to, uh, that's, well, you probably want one that is going to enable copy on write uh, rather than linking. There is one of these tools called BDUP, but it's not in Debian yet. So any ButterFS fans out there want to have deduplication, think about packaging that. Is that going to be part of an existing package? Uh, part of butter tools, yeah. <laughs> Apparently, it's, it's going to be part of butter. Stream, but I'll just package it together. Okay, so it looks like this is going to be uh, uh, added to ButterFS tools. Uh, NF tables. It's yet another file firewalling API. <laughs> <laughs> As if we didn't have enough already. Okay, well, I'll explain why why this is actually a good thing. Currently, we have IP tables for IPv4. We have IP6 tables for IPv6 firewall, firewalling. We have ARP tables for the ARP protocol. And we have EB tables for uh, Ethernet bridges, working at the Ethernet level. Uh, all of them are protocol specific. Uh, they need a kernel module for each kind of matching you might want to do. They need a kernel <coughs> module for each, uh, each action. Um, I think some of the, the actions are somewhat shareable between these. Uh, the, they're all based on the, the kernel's uh, NetFilter API internally, which is somewhat more flexible, uh, but only if, you want, only if you're prepared to write another module. So the NF tables API exposes uh, more of that flexibility. Uh, it adds a, a kind of a virtual machine similar to the to the Berkeley packet filter that's that's commonly uh, commonly used for uh, for packet filtering on sockets. Um, I'm not quite clear on why it needed a different virtual machine, uh, but apparently it did. PPF wasn't quite good enough, so userland can generate uh, matching code. Uh, and upload that into the kernel, and it'll all be safe, probably, because it's limited to what it, uh, it's sandboxed within this uh, sp specific virtual machine. Uh, so we have a userland tool, NF tables, uh, which uses this API. It's already packaged, so that's great. Uh, but the next stage, which is going to happen somewhere down the line, I don't know quite how far off it is, is all those old firewall APIs are now redundant. Um, but because you can, you can generate all that matching code in userland now, you don't need specific, uh, you don't need specific native code for it. Um, so the userland tools, IP tables, IP6 tables, and so on, will need to be ported to use NF tables. Um, um, hopefully upstream maintainers for those will do that. All right, so lock debugging uh, is something you're going to, that uh, is, well, multi-threaded programs um, often have bugs involving locks, and the kernel is, is a massively multi-threaded program. Uh, it has well, every every single task that exists in userland uh, can also run in the kernel. So you've got a thread for each of those. Uh, um, you have kernel internal threads. You have interrupts. You have soft interrupts. You have non-maskable interrupts. So you have a huge number of, of uh, interesting interactions there. Lots of different synchronization mechanisms: uh, mutexes, spin locks, RW locks. And then you have uh, locking uh, locking operations that may inhibit interrupts or uh, soft interrupts temporarily. Uh, and hopefully we avoid uh, data races that way. Uh, but with all this, all this locking going on, uh, unfortunately we, we might do locking in the wrong order and get deadlocks. Uh, easy to introduce and, and um, of course they will bite users in the field and then we don't know how to reproduce them. 
Uh, for some years now, the kernel has had a system called LockDAP, which dynamically tracks uh, the locking operations, sequences of locking operations. Uh, but then it will do a sort of a st static comparison of these dynamic sequences and it will work out, supposing these, uh, supposing these sequences have occurred in parallel, then could that potentially result in a deadlock? And so, although it's not a pure static analyzer, it's, uh, it can uh, very quickly find many types of, of deadlock bug. So that's, that's helped to fix, find and fix a lot of bugs. Um, uh, and in conjunction with um, uh, the Trinity uh, fuzzing tool, that's, that's, uh, that's um, resulted in a lot of improvements in, in the robustness of the kernel. So now you too, in user land, uh, can use LockDAP. Uh, just as soon as we get around to packaging it, uh, it's available as a library, uh, which is in the uh, in the Linux source tree, uh, and it should be built from the Linux tools source package. Uh, only it isn't yet. Uh, so I hope to find time to do this. Uh, if that's something that sounds really interesting to you, then uh, please please help. Uh, So we have a couple of new ports. Well, actually, there are lots and lots of new architectures being added to Linux all the time, uh, many of which are not supported in Debian. But uh, the ARM64 architecture, uh, although it sounds, uh, well, it sounds a lot like ARM and comes from the same company, is actually very, very different from the 32-bit ARM. And it's treated as, uh, currently treated as a completely separate <laughs> Uh, thing in the kernel. The initial support for this was added over a year ago, but it wasn't really usable. Uh, but in the last year, uh, it has become usable. It's been become, in fact, it's reached a point where you can run it on both emulators and real hardware. I believe that the Debian packages of the ARM64 kernel do run on real hardware, although I haven't seen it happen for myself. If anyone wants to donate me an ARM64 uh, board to uh, test that, I'm <laughs> perfectly, willing to, uh, perfectly willing to take it. Uh, the kernels had support for PowerPC for a very long time. Um, and um, we supported several different variants of that. We've had PowerPC 32 bit in Debian. We've had an unofficial port to 64 bits, both of which are big engine. Um, and the kernel has always run as big engine, although it supports little engine um, user land. I don't think we support that in Debian, but the kernel did. Uh, recently, there's been this uh, the Open Power Consortium uh, has decided that Power is going to be far more popular if it only it could, was uh, little engine. I think, that's, I think that's what it is, anyway. So, so we now have the PPC 64EL port, 64-bit uh, little engine, uh, both kernel and user land. That landed in Linux 3.13. Uh, the kernel can run as little engine as well. And there's a new, um, there's a subtly different user land API for that. And both of these are are being bootstrapped in Unstable as we speak. Uh, I think they're making quite good progress. And they might even make it into Jesse. Um, so file private locking is, is not another one of those things which is not particularly exciting, but it sort of fixes a bug in POSIX. Uh, which is, POSIX is the, is the standard that uh, Linux and Unix and similar uh, kernels uh, attempt to follow uh, as a kind of a core uh, core interface to our core API. POSIX says that if you if you lock a file, uh, uh, then as soon as you close any file descriptor to that to that file, you or that your process uh, drops its locks on that file. 
thing is, you can open the same file multiple times. You can have multiple file descriptors in it. If you have a multi-threaded process, you might well have multiple threads that don't know about each other, opening the same file, uh, locking the file, locking different ranges of the, of the file, because these are range locks, not whole file locks. Uh, as soon as one thread closes the file, oops, it dropped the locks that belong to the other thread as well. So your multi-threaded process now will need serialization around opening and closing files, which is a bit silly. Uh, what's more, you're going to you have the problem of hardened symbolic links, uh, which mean that maybe those files you thought were two different files are actually the same file. Uh, so the serialization still doesn't help you. So uh, we have a solution to this. We have a new type of lock, um, which well, it's almost the same type of lock, but it has the right semantics. Now it's associated with the open file handle. So uh, the two threads that open the file. Uh, now have completely separate sets of logs associated with our open file. Um, Multi-key block devices don't need any uh, don't need anything new from your application. These are a performance feature. Uh, every block device that corresponds to a physical device, a physical disk, uh, is likely to have some kind of Command queue or request queue, which has all the uh, all the reads and writes that have been uh, have been started or are about to start on that block device. Uh, depending on the capabilities of the hardware, the hardware might you might only be able to send one command to the hardware at once, or you might be able to send multiple commands. That's called NCQ. Uh, in any case, the queue is maintained in software. If you only have a single queue for your single device, then the, uh, the uh, adding things into the queue and taking things off, the, handing things over to the hardware, that has to be serialized. And then the completions are also being handled through a single uh, context. So you potentially have uh, interprocessor interrupts to wake up uh, uh, processes on, on other CPUs. So for if you have a really fast SSD, that can be a bottleneck. Uh, if you have a really fast SSD, it might actually support multiple queues. Uh, but the, uh, that doesn't help you so long as the kernel is using a single queue. Uh, that's finally changed in, in 3.16. You can have, uh, if the driver supports it, there can be multiple queues for a block device. You can have multiple CPUs uh, adding to these queues in parallel, uh, sending commands to the to the device in parallel, and completions come back uh, in parallel. And hopefully, everything gets. Uh, uh, you don't have any. Um, uh, you don't have so much contention between different tasks using the using the, uh, the device. So far, however, there's only one driver that supports this, uh, which is MTIP32XX, which is for a very expensive uh, family of SSDs. Um, I believe that some that the SCSI block drivers for um, the, the, the SCSI drivers that work with. Uh, some other kinds of SSDs uh, are going to support this soon, but they missed 3.16. NVMe? NVMe? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I missed that. Okay, so, N so NVMe. I'm repeating, it. I'm repeating it with the microphone. <laughs> so NVMe is already multi-queue. OK, great. So I think that covers all the, uh, all the really fast SSDs, probably. Great. Uh, so OK. 
so if any, anyone has questions, uh, I can ask them now. I can also go back to talking about the uh, the uh, network busy polling, which is another sort of interesting high performance feature. And there are no more questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Oh, questions, asking things. He totally answers. So, with with just thank you, with Jesse having frozen at three sixteen, um, but it's not um, not yet like slushy. I heard is the description. Um, <laughs> what is the? Well, it's not. Uh, the, the, we haven't frozen. We uh, we're not freezing until November. Um, and well, 3.16 isn't in isn't in unstable yet. The next upload will be based on 3.16. So, what is the opportunity for getting patches that were accepted and queued for 3.17 um, into 3.16, Jesse? The chances of that happening are very good, if you ask now. Uh, <laughs> less so as we get towards the freeze, and beyond the freeze, we can still take patches for hardware enablements, so new drivers spot for new models, and so on, uh, they're still OK. But uh, the, earlier, the earlier you ask, the better. Um, I don't believe, personally, that GeoSec is uh, magic. But so many people have been requesting that GeoSec get in Debian, that it's getting on Manerve. Uh, <laughs> is there a chance that we ever get a, maybe a Flavor GRSEC in Debian? GRSEC is not going to support 3.16 for very long, so far as I know. So that's not really going to work uh, as a as a patch within the uh, within the Linux package. There is possibly, there was some discussion several months back about the possibility of doing a, uh, a, a separate Linux GLSEC pack, package, which will be based on the 3.13 or 3.14 branch, whichever it, it is that's, um, that's going to have long-term support from the uh, GLSEC developers. Um, Uh, but I haven't seen any sign that that's actually happening. Uh, I, I don't think that's, anyone's tried uploading to uh, to that to new yet. It's not going to come from the kernel team because we've kind of got our hands full. Uh, See you otherwise. Hi, uh, thanks for all your work on the kernel team. Uh, first, uh, uh, maybe just to make sure I understood the answer to the previous question, I think what you, I think your answer was, if someone wants to upload Linux GRSec, then that's plausible. Is that basically the summary? Yes. Um, I mean, the usual objection to that would be. It's more or less duplicating code, and we don't. And the security team doesn't like there being duplicate code in the uh, in the archive. However, in this case, I think there was a, a tentative. Yes, it would be okay in this case um, because both of them are fairly well supported, or something like that. Okay, and then my other question is about backports kernels. Uh, I use backports kernels, but I kind of just install them willy-nilly whenever. Is there a schedule or a plan, or I'm glad they happen, but when and why do they happen? Uh, they are, I hope, kept more or less up to date with testing. 
Um, I don't always remember to upload as soon as the testing propagation happens, but I hope I'm being. Uh, I, hope, I hope I'm doing the uploads in a fairly timely fashion. Thanks. Any further questions? That's oh, right. That goes for Wheezy backports. I haven't I haven't done any uploads for Squeeze backports for some time now, uh, and possibly I I may do that uh, to, to uh, support Squeeze LTS, uh, but I haven't got around to it yet. Sorry if this is a question from an out, uh, from an outsider, but um, oh, sorry, from an outsider view, is there any qualification process or testing done on the kernels as they go into either backports or testing or unstable? With um, a no, lot not of really. Okay. <laughs> for for testing propagation, it's it's the usual uh, the usual rule, which is uh, if there are new release critical bugs raised against the version in an unstable, that will block propagation to testing. Okay. And hopefully, if, it, if, it's in, if it's okay in testing, well, anything that goes into backports was previously in testing, so barring compiler bugs or incompatibilities, then, then it should be all right in backports as well. Okay. I um, it's not really very satisfactory, but that's, okay. without a hardware qualification lab, that's, that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's the best we can do at the moment. I was asking this in particular because the um, the it, a lot of uh, Google Compute Engine's customers are running the backports kernel. In fact, the, the vast majority are. Um, right. And around the upgrade from 3.14. Yeah, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, a lot of the customers were. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, a lot of the customers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So a lot of Google Compute Engine's customers, the, the vast majority, are running the backports kernel. Okay. Um, around the upgrade from 3.13 to 3.14, um, customers would get the, the kernel as, as it comes out, but we had a very large number of bugs start appearing. Um, so I was wondering if there was any plans for a testing process or a qualification process around kernels being put into backports. Um. If you want to, if you want to, uh, if you want to help with that, you know, um, if you want to provide some of your engineering time to, to help with that, that would be very much appreciated because no one wants to upload broken uh, packages. But as it is, um, um, no one on the kernel team has a lot of time to spend on this, unfortunately. Looks like we're done here. So um, thank you all very much for coming out in droves to, um, to hear about the panel.